Ableton On Air is generously supported by Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Other sponsorship include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Hello and welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lawrence Seiler. Arlene is off today. Thank you to our wonderful sponsors, especially Washington County Mental Health and Green Mountain Support Services. With us to discuss this um, important topic of nursing and people with special needs. What if you are a person with a special need and need extra nursing care? Where do we turn? Uh, with us to discuss that is Green Mountain Support Services. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Great. Hi, my name is Christina Bell and I'm a registered nurse at Green Mountain Support Services. I primarily work with individuals with developmental disabilities. I also work with Tanner in the traumatic brain injury and adult family care programs. I've been at the agency for about a little over two years now. And you are? Yep, and I'm Tanner uh, Cadlick, also a registered nurse, and as Christina said, I work primarily with uh, uh, the adult family care program, so older adults needing more assistance uh, to live in their communities, and uh, uh, individuals with traumatic brain injuries. So what is, okay, what is uh, the missions and goals of Green Mountain Support Services and the nursing program? Um, so our, uh, I guess, our company uh, 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 focus is um, em empowering neighbors to, uh, with disabilities to be at home in their community. Mm -hmm. And so uh, basically what this means is that uh, as people progress through life and they need more and more services, it's our focus to keep people um, in a position where they can really have a say on what's going on in their life and really experience everything that they want to and not have to rely on um, institutional support. Mm -hmm. When you say rely on institutional support, take me back, I know years ago, uh, um, there were, especially in Vermont, Brandon State School and other institutions. How has nursing changed over those years and going into now? Um, like to yeah, I think that. there's, I think, so first off, I just wanted to reiter reiterate that. If us, we make a mistake, we can always go Yeah, back. that's yeah. fine. So us as nurses, I feel as though our primary mission is to support the health and wellness of all the clients that we serve through Green Mountain Support Services, whether they have de developmental disabilities or, you know, they're elderly and they have some sort of disability, and our primary focus is to keep them in the home. And that's how it had been in the past with a lot of institutions that, you know, they would have group homes or they would have just a designated institution like the branded training school where individuals were sort of grouped together mm -hmm. and it was sort of this, you know, they were all grouped together and together they would just be there in this one area and they were not, it was not reflected at so much as, you know, you're in your home, you're in your comfortable environment, um, it was more of sort of, you know, you have all these strange faces around in this, you know, big building. And so we're mostly trying to keep people in their homes where they're comfortable, mm -hmm. where they can sort of, you know, have that autonomy to be themselves. Um, when we say being independent and being on our own, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with nursing care, what exactly does that mean and how does that work? Take that one, Tina. Um, as far as being independent, we want to give people as many opportunities as they can to do everything that they can within their ability. And then um, we From are... From ADL skills on down, right? ADL skills, even to um, uh, where we come in is kind of more nursing-centered skills. Um, we just want to make sure that all the support is there for that person to be as independent as possible. Describe support in, in this case. Um, so. For example, if um, um, outside of ADL, say that there is more of a nursing type procedure, like the first example that's popping to mind is say someone has a catheter. That's something that is gonna 
require an extra level of skill that most um, people that are providing just basic services aren't going to have. So that's mm -hmm. where we come in and we can uh, coordinate with the physician that's prescribing um, this catheter or any other device. For those that don't know, what is a catheter and so, cer certain um, devices that are used? In so yeah, uh, for example, a catheter would aid in people uh, being able to fully drain their bladders. Um, and go to the restroom, yeah. Yeah, and so, uh, and that just requires a certain skill set and that's our job to step in and make sure that the people supporting um, our client are educated and able to perform that procedure, or not procedure, but help them with those skills um, and do so properly and safely. Okay, um, since you guys work with developmental disabilities and your dis developmental disability nurses, is there, besides nursing school, because you're an RN, right? Mm -hmm. Besides nursing school, is there any other specific training that you go through being uh, being and working with people with developmental disabilities mm -hmm. or you know in this case it might be dual diagnosed as, so can you explain sure. some of that yeah so green mountain support services has a lot of different training opportunities not just for nurses but right across the board for everyone we have a class that we take called therapeutic options with um, our great staff marilyn carter who um, teaches that and she basically talks about approaches to use with individuals with developmental disabilities it might be um, a therapeutic communication technique um, it might be communication strategies um, just to sort of um, make the person that does not have as much experience working with someone with developmental disabilities a little easier. Um, just things that, you know, we've all picked up on the, in the past, um, things of that nature. Um, I'm, I've also been offered through the agency to do a death doula certificate course through the University of Vermont. So Say that again. It's called a death doula course. What exactly um, is that? So that actually helps support the person who is in the middle of end of life care, um, just helps them and supports them with that process and working with them to sort of make that process easier. And it's help. called death doula. Death doula. Mm -hmm. So doula is a Greek word. It basically means, I think it's helper or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, so it basically assists someone in their end of life dying process. Since you said that, what is your opinion, being a nurse, mm -hmm. um, just, just an opinion question, mm -hmm. on, um, you know, there are certain, now I know we're dealing with the opioid crisis and everything, but there, there are certain drugs such as fentanyl dealing with end of life and cancer and certain challenges that mm -hmm. people might have mm -hmm. uh, and um, euthanasia and all of that stuff mm -hmm. there's a history with that what being a nurse what is your opinion on the deaf doula end of life situation mm -hmm. and those drugs and and that type of thing mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the situation and the person and the the sort of their own opinion. Mm -hmm. um, my opinion is it's whatever is right and best for that person at that given time mm -hmm. because every situation is going to be different. Every pain and comfort level is going to be different. Um, and there's a lot of stigma out there about, you know, uh, pain relief and using those types of heavy euthanasia, you know, um, sort of pain relieving medications. Mm -hmm. um, as far as euthanasia goes and actually going through that process. I've actually worked in the past at a home health agency mm -hmm. and we actually had a patient that was going through that process and um, it was what they had you know wanted at the time mm -hmm. and they felt that that was best for them. They weren't going to get better. Mm -hmm. um, as nurses we're not actually, um, it's out of our scope of practice to participate in that. Um, with a hands-on approach. Mm -hmm. We sort of are overseers of care, but we can't really step in and help with that particular process. Mm -hmm. um, but we can support the, the patient and make sure that they know we're there to support them. And if they need to talk 
um, if they need, you know, some sort of intervention, you know, whether it be a heating pad or, you know, just sitting with them and listening. If they're in hospice, music. they want their, uh, a great meal. Exactly. That type if of If they want to eat mm -hmm. candy, chocolate, cakes, cupcakes, whatever. Lobster, whatever. Lobster, <laughs> whatever they want, you know, we're there to, you know, we're there to help them and then, and you know, and talk about the dying process and what things to expect and um, so yeah, we do get, we do get involved with all of that. Um, it's just uh, we. Tanner, do you want to take the same question? Uh, yeah, and I think it comes down to the core of nursing is our real role is to advocate for either our patient or our client, um, but uh, to be able to do that, we need to make sure that everyone is educated um, as to all their options as best as we understand them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ethics, very important. Uh, HIPAA, certain types of ethics, what, in terms of your field in developmental disabilities, what can a nurse do, what can't you do, and the overstepping of, like, I'll give an example. If, um, you know, can you have a relationship with the patient in terms of, you know, dealing with family and that type of thing? How, how does that work within ethics? Um, it's, um, it's kind of a tricky uh, question. One, one, because the nursing field is really, really diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many different avenues that you can pursue it as far as where you take care of clients. As far as um, our setting, um, we kind of have to uh, get to know our clients uh, and really be part of, mm -hmm. or not necessarily be part of, but be aware of their everyday life and like know their interests so that we can advocate for them for the things that they are wanting mm -hmm. to have happen. Um, you mentioned HIPAA, that gets kind of tricky because um, when you are out in the community, you have to be careful um, about, what you say. But what you say, and this is especially true for like our, our service providers or people that are with the patient day to day to day, they can't say, go to a, a restaurant and say, oh shoot, I forgot your lactulose. You're not gonna be able to have anything dairy. And it's just, so I mean, just simple things like that that you might have in like a day to day conversation with like anyone in your family, it's like you, it can be very easy to mm -hmm. forget that this is still a client whose um, privacy that you have an obligation to protect. Mm -hmm. So, um, abuse and nursing, and, you know, nursing homes, hospitals, etc. You told me off camera that Vermont is strict mm -hmm. on that. How mm -hmm. strict? Um, how has laws changed regarding that? Uh, this question goes to both of you guys. Mm -hmm. How, how strict ha has that been, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So Vermont is a very, very high advocate for particularly elderly and um, our younger populations. People with special needs, yeah. Absolutely, and, and all individuals with disabilities. So basically, not just us as healthcare providers are um, what is called a mandated reporter, which mm -hmm. is someone that- Explain what that yep, is. Yep, so it's someone that must report if they suspect any, any kind of abuse, you know, whether it be bruising or um, things of that nature. Someone says something that they were, you know, maybe they were pushed or they fall down or something happens and there's maybe a little bit sus suspicion of abuse. They are mandated to report that to the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So basically that doesn't just encompass Tanner and myself as nurses, it also encompasses the service coordinators that we actually work hand in hand with at the agency. What and does a service coordinator do yeah. within your nursing mm -hmm. situation? So we, we actually work um, with service coordinators quite, quite frequently in the field. Um, they have about 15 maybe to 17 clients on their caseloads, depending on you know how that fluctuates. Um, basically, they have a client that they specialize in work with, mm -hmm. um, and then we coordinate with them any sort of 
you know, they, if they have any sort of special needs, any, you know, care that they might need, we coordinate that through the mm -hmm. service coordinator. So is the service coordinator, does it act like an interdisciplinary team? Like you have several, <coughs> several coordinators to deal with any one person? So we have, oh, how many would you say, Tanner? About 10, 15 yeah, like, service yeah. coordinators. Per person or the agency? So per agency, we have around 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. And then they, in turn, have several different clients that they work with individually. So though it's service coordination slash, slash case management. Mm -hmm. So they, um, they work with, with, they have their familiar service coordinator or case manager, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and then that person, Tanner or, and, or I, can work directly with to um, say, okay, hey, do you, do you know, you know when their discharge from the hospital was and you know, if there's any special care that we need to follow up with or you know, where did this discharge note go from the hospital? And um, so that's, that's sort of how we, we work with them. So. Okay, um, let's talk more about the independence of people within the agency or mm -hmm. the um, people that you work with. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, let's go more into that. Sure. What type of independence do you really help them with? Like, mm -hmm. um, let's dive in. Go ahead. Yep. Do you want to take that one? Uh, sure. Um, and I feel it's. Uh, that's a very personalized um, question and like it's different from person to person and just mm -hmm. um, we really have very uh, uh, person-centered goals for each person. So what exactly is a person -centered? And so let's say um, person -centered I just goal. have a client coming to mind like just um, being able to um, go out in the community and go shopping without um, being really anxious or overwhelmed with the situation so that we can look at that and just see what steps need to be taken and have some measured progress. So in other words, if they go to a mall, they might, sometimes they might be overwhelmed with the amount of crowds. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, even, and a lot that of that stuff that we, yeah, a lot of uh, people that we work with um, have um, fairly significant uh, behavioral issues um, mm -hmm. as well, and so, um, sometimes that is a big focus, just being able to um, be empowered to go out in the community. Even though they're, they're living in a moderately independent setting, um, they still might feel very restricted as far as what they are willing to do uh, Like personally. for example, the, I, mean, I mean, for example, you might work with a client, um, and I've been overseas, that has a problem like getting into a closed space like an airplane. Mm -hmm. Like how do you deal with, let's say, a 15 hour trip to Israel or a 12 mm -hmm. hour trip to Israel. Uh -huh. That, I mean of course you can walk around in the plane and, and do things, you mm -hmm. know, not stay with the exception of them telling you that you have to fasten your seatbelt. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. How would you deal, if I was a client of yours mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, or someone in the agency that needed your help, mm -hmm. how would you uh, work with me, mm -hmm. uh, let's say my wife and I, how would you work with us getting up to that point um, yeah. in terms of that example? Yeah, so in terms of that example, we would work with the both of you together. We might have you come in to the office for a meeting and just discuss your um, what what's going on and your discomfort with the flying so to speak um, we might recommend some you know interventions maybe that you've tried in the past that have helped comfort you we might also work with if you have a psychiatrist or if you have a, a specialist or a provider that we can connect with and collaborate with we mm -hmm. might work with them as well mm -hmm. there might be some sort of a you know depending on your belief system um, there might be some sort of a herbal supplement or some sort of a psychiatric medication that you might be able to take to help comfort you on the plane flight. But there are, 
other alternatives than that. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. So music or something. Yeah, absolutely. So if if you know, like I said in the beginning, if you know, if you have things that have worked and you've tried in the past, that you know, maybe there is some soothing music or there's some aromatherapy. Another example, my it, when you work with a client, might be um, if a person has to go take an MRI, that closed space, that machine, mm -hmm. you know. It's, that would be, mm -hmm. for me, That that's difficult. Mm -hmm. So those are the mm -hmm. things you probably will work absolutely, on. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and I've heard of people actually going in with earbuds and listening to some music prior to that particular procedure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was really comforting because they could listen to a song that was something that they'd always listen to that sort of calmed them down. What other oh. things do, we, do you work with, with the person? Other independent. Um, yep. So um, we things. we actually we actually work directly with our shared living providers. Mm -hmm. um, so that explain way, explain what a shared living provider is. Sure. So our shared living providers are individuals that are contracted through our agency who share their homes with our clients. So it's not a group home setting. It's not a group ho home setting whatsoever. All of our all of the clients that are um, obtained services from Green Mountain Support Services have. Um, Does Vermont have group homes or mainly shared living providers? It's shared living providers. We've pretty much since the closing of the training of the Brandon School, it's mm -hmm. been, we've had the shared living provider uh, mm -hmm. dynamic, which is amazing. Okay, because, so explain what that is. Sure, so um, it, within the community, shared living providers who are just people like you and me, um, they basically get background checks through the agency and they're contracted if they pass um, to you know go ahead and have a particular client uh, whether they be a traumatic brain injury adult family care or a person with developmental disabilities they would go into their home and they would live there mm -hmm. so and that's what they're called as a shared living provider because they're sharing their home Green, Green Mountain Support Services would would they go to the family's house to see if it's appropriate first? Mm -hmm. They do, they, they actually do. They go on a, the service coordinators that w would work with the particular client coming on. Um, they would go in and they would check the home and they would have um, our administrative staff go in and do a home inspection. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not really sure as far as the, the home inspection process, Michelle could speak better mm -hmm. to that, um, but they have to go through rigorous um, home inspection process. So they want to make sure the capacity's there and if there, there's handicap accessible needs that those are, those are there in mm -hmm. place. So. Uh, your take on more independence? Um, I just think it's um, really, it's a, a wonderful setting having someone being able to open their, their home to someone because, uh, I mean, not only do uh, does a client have a, a lot of support already just set up right when you get there because it's a uh, uh, already set and functioning home, but they are also uh, involved in everything that family is typically doing, and so um, uh, I think everyone, client included, is really invested in just the that family dynamic, and so mm -hmm. they're involved in a lot of every in everything that they're doing. What exactly? What is family dynamics in terms of this case? Um, I mean, they're. Um, I mean, uh, definition of. Um, um, I'm my definition of family dynamics is just like um, you're in everybody's problem is yours and your problems is is everybody's, and so mm -hmm. everyone's there to support each other, and um, whether that um, is. Waking up, making sure everyone like gets breakfast and is getting out the door to their appointments or um, all that stuff, or dealing with um, the emotion that like holidays will bring up. Like a lot of times, like holidays can be really hard for people, um, um, especially if you're away from your family and having that um, that new um, network of support and again that other family dynamic is. There to catch people when they need a little bit of a boost. What what? Um, <clears throat> okay, what are some misconceptions around the nursing field when you work with developmental disabilities that might not you know you know based on the regular nursing field? Mm -hmm. Any? Yeah. So. 
We actually just had a nursing meeting not too long ago at GMSS where we were discussing how our particular field of nursing is a weird field of nursing. <laughs> we all we all related why, it. Why do you call it that? Go ahead. We, we, we all just sort of called it a weird field of nursing because it's not your typical hospital nursing mm -hmm. and it's not the generalized home health nursing and it's sort of, we don't really have sort of a <clears throat> label, so to speak. Um, I, whenever I put down, you know, what type of nursing I do, I consider it more of a community health nursing because I'm, I'm, I wear many hats. So you don't want to say on a resume, to Venomo Disability Nurse? Oh yes, I do, I do want to say that. I have mm -hmm. that right on my res resume. Um, but we're sort of working as a team in with all different clients, whether they be developmental disabilities, because Tanner and I cross train. So we're working with developmental disabilities, we're working with traumatic brain injury mm -hmm. patients and um, adult speak, family care. So we consider ourselves in the community nurses with all of those populations. How does that work? Since you said that you're working with um, um, trauma traumatic brain injury, describe what a traumatic brain injury is and how does your nursing deal with that? Um, so, uh, basically a traumatic brain injury is usually related to some type of trauma <laughs> that... Mm -hmm. um, uh, car accident. Either car accident or it could be um, um, uh, otherwise, sometimes there is an extended period where there's uh, a lack of oxygen to the brain and certain parts of the brain are uh, damaged. Um, but it uh, t uh, typically results in uh, people having um, kind of uh, a poor like impulse control. Um, I one of the beautiful things I love about people with traumatic brain injuries is you never have to wonder what they're thinking about you because they will be more than happy to let you know whatever's <laughs> on their mind. And it's, it's, it's really refreshing. I know a lot of people are kind of taken aback when they get very um, open, uh, blunt and honest um, answers and questions. Um, but it's, it's wonderful um, uh, encountering someone that uh, doesn't have uh, that filter uh, necessarily in place mm -hmm. um, just because you don't have to to guess and that's just uh, it's a wonderful uh, view into a, a very honest world and so one that doesn't really stand on um, uh, I guess societal norms um, okay. if that's <laughs> um, okay well when we say that since I, you say societal norms, mm -hmm. what are some of the misconceptions around people with special needs when you first meet them? Because you're in the nursing field, mm -hmm. so things, we are normal, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. We're considered normal and we should um, be part of society, but what are some norms in terms of? I, just from just from some of the feedback I've heard from out in the community, mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of fear involved with with community members because they don't they just don't understand. So they fear the unknown and what they don't know about and what they're not educated about. We actually had a story where one of our um, one of our staff members working out in the field was working with one of our clients and. Um, one of our clients was sort of uh, abrupt and, you know, was calling out really loudly in a store. And um, one of the the shoppers in the store was actually pretty um, vocal about, um, you know, the fact that she was raising her voice in the store. And our staff member sort of said, well, you don't really understand this person, you know, has a disability so and and was sort of like they were not as understanding and fearful because they didn't understand so what so because they didn't understand what actually happened with that customer in the store did, did the customer say anything else I don't think they said anything else I think that was the extent of the interaction but I I just think it's it's sort of the lack of 
the lack of exposure and the lack of, you know, because we have to remember that because in the past there was that sort of institutionalized feel mm -hmm. that individuals might not have been in the community as much and mm -hmm. now they are. Mm -hmm. So so we just need to keep educating folks on, you know, mm -hmm. on uh, our, Tanner, um, uh, your take on that question, what um, are some misconceptions? Yeah, and I, I think um, a lot of it comes back to like people don't typically have exposure to um, people that um, have different disabilities and I think so often we're raised on this um, ideal of um, being polite and not pointing things out and I mean I remember when I was younger I was told like it's not polite to stare and so like I think out of this or, po or, point. or, or point or even question or say why is this the case with this person. Mm -hmm. um, I think just out of our kind of ingrained and kind of built up um, desire not to feel uneasy or not to um, point out something that we feel is different that um, the public in general tends to ignore a lot of people with disabilities just because we don't want to bridge that gap. We don't we don't really feel comfortable growing in that moment because we're just busy like trying to look as normal as we can too. And so mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I think people are kind of trying to be polite to a fault, and it's just something that people need more exposure to. And once uh, people start seeing, say, um, a person in a wheelchair or sitting in a wheelchair instead of seeing a wheelchair coming down the street and how they need to politely avoid the situation, mm. interact with that person. Like, um, Are people sometimes afraid with interacting with people or they just don't know? Um, I, I think it's more just the not knowing. It can, I think it can be intimidating for a lot of people just because, um, I mean, you're just, I think a lot of people are really afraid of offending someone that has been living with a disability their whole life and they forget that they've been dealing with this for a lot uh, of times their whole life and, and so they know they're um, aware. <laughs> being a nurse, ha have you ever had to interact with the police or anyone else of authority and if so, how does that deal within your field? Like if it gets to a point where you have to involve with um, Police department, um, you know, medically, because mm -hmm. um, I know the police now are trained or be getting more training with the people with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little so bit more? So I personally have haven't had to work with any anyone from um, the law, any sort of law professional. Um, I know that there have been service coordinators in the past that I've had to work with. Um, persons from the law, uh, police officers. Um, I think there's a lot of explanation that goes along with that. Um, mm -hmm. It's really difficult because we have to get multiple individuals involved because we, again, we can't violate that HIPAA. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be really careful and there's a whole team approach to that, mm -hmm. so. In terms of team approach, uh, historically, how has that changed and how is that getting better through the nursing field, working in teams? Yes, no. Um, and I feel, um, it's, at least speaking with our agencies, um, we do have uh, a lot of people involved in a, one person's care. Like we have a service coordinator, we have nursing, we have uh, program managers and clinical directors that are all making sure everything's flowing the right way and that attention's being focused where it needs to be. At and if it topics. doesn't go the right way, then you go back to the drawing board. Yeah, and um, but then we, um, one of our big roles is just coord uh, coordinating with different providers, whether that be um, uh, primary care providers or psychologists or psych psychiatrists or um, neurologists or uh, whatever the situation is that is kind of uh, kind of blooming at the moment. That's what we, we get the support from whichever area really needs to, that it needs to come from and make sure that um, those other um, providers are aware that there is a situation because a lot of times they have hundreds of clients that they're working with as well. So. Healthcare and the budget, uh, opinion 
question. Um, how how has that changed? Or because I know healthcare, a lot of things are being cut, and services mm -hmm. for people with disabilities are being cut. Mm -hmm. Um, how does that change within your field of developmental disabilities? It makes it more challenging, uh, <laughs> to say I'm the sorry, least. I'm sorry, if I'm asking the right question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It definitely makes it more challenging. What I've seen most recently is a lot of cuts with home health services, ah. which makes it... And why is that? Only because of the funding for home health has decreased substantially, which is very surprising because it seems like that's the way um, the future is looking, is to have more individuals in their home. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of you know dynamic, dynamics with politics and um, the funding with our current government leadership that is trickling down um, and is affecting that particular... So home health... Home health is a better way of looking at things rather than putting p persons in nursing homes, correct? Absolutely. So if, if, if we want to, to compare some of the institutions we had for individuals with disability, intellectual disabilities, mm -hmm. we can kind of in the same way compare that to n nursing homes for the elderly, right? Mm -hmm. Well, nursing homes at some point were taking or can take people that aren't older age. If mm -hmm. you're absolutely if you're going through some medical thing and you're 16, 17 years old, mm -hmm. a nursing home might take you depending on a situation. Mm -hmm. Could and 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 also just you know, I feel like the home back to the home health piece mm -hmm. is that's really what Tanner and my job is to make sure that those services are in place and they're in place the way that they need to be and they should be for the type of care that's being provided in the home. Um, we're, also, we're also there at the agency to make sure things that don't get missed. We actually had um, a hospital that had forgot to write a discharge note Ooh. and <sighs> home health services were not in put in place order-wise, and they should have been. So we followed up with that, and the home health's in place now, the order's there, so we're good. And, you know, we just, we're really good at picking up on if something's missing, and we need to sort of put that puzzle piece in place. Tanner, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, but yeah. do you have any other to add to that? Um, and I feel like any time you're keeping someone out of a hospital setting is going to be beneficial for... Um, Unless they need it. Exactly. And I feel like um, a lot of the issue we're seeing, um, especially in this area of the country, is there's just a big lack of uh, nurses available. And so I think their staffing is always going to be a big issue. And, um, and if people are continually going into the hospital for every little thing where it could have been managed at home, then we're just putting more stress on the system. You mean like a hypochondriac it. type of thing? Like going, in, I need to go in the hospital, I need to go in the hospital, because you're, mm -hmm. you're wasting cities' money yeah, when and, and you're that, constantly or, costing, call, calling the ambulance. Mm -hmm. Or even just um, having um, nurses available like myself and Christina, or just home health to do a uh, quick visit and say, I'm very concerned about this, I need a nurse to come and look at it. Mm -hmm. And we can give a quick assessment and give our assessment to their primary care provider uh, so that they can either uh, say, yeah, like we need you to go to a hospital or no, I think you'll be okay, let's give it a couple days, do this and that, and then we'll reevaluate them. So. Um, okay, uh, last thing before we address the phone number. Uh, um, What's the difference between um, level one, level two, and level three care? Or is there like uh, ways of putting it, like a, a, a level three care facility, uh, you know, because I know mm -hmm. we want to keep the person in the home, but let's say they cannot mm -hmm. be there with a certain ways of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Do you want to speak to that one? I'm kind of yeah. crazy on it. So. Yep. So 
we don't really we don't particularly work with levels of care. Um, it's more of it's more of looking at the person as an individual and seeing what their strengths are and their weaknesses, ah. and you know, figuring out the big picture as far as what you know what aspects of your health do we need to focus on? Do we need to get physical therapy involved? Do we need to get occupational therapy mm -hmm. involved? Um, do we need to have you see a neurologist or how do we, you know, how do we go about making your life better and easier and healthier? Uh, um, in the home. In mm -hmm. the home, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I guess, yeah, our, our big role is um, yeah. like if there is like, if someone is questioning whether they are in like an emergency situation or not, they can, we're there to kind of take in what the situation is as they describe it and then uh, okay. advise as far as well, can I do. Can I just say one more thing too? Yes, yeah. um, I just want to say that I, I really enjoy working with all the populations that we serve, whether they be with intellectual disabilities, adult family care, or traumatic brain injury, and GMSS is an excellent place to work for. I'm actually a member through them of the v Developmental Disabilities Nursing Association, which is a great resource, and I'm actually going to their conference this year, which I'm really excited about. So, <laughs> sorry, Moving just had up. to plug that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, you, you're, um, you want to say anything else about uh, Green Mountain Support Services? Um, it's just a, it's a wonderful place to be. Um, and coming from the, I came from a hospital setting. And, and you uh, didn't like that per se. Um, I, I really loved it, actually. Um, the, uh, the schedule is really hard. Um, it's very easy to um, uh, get tired and depleted and a little uh, yeah, maybe hospitals, jaded. Because hospitals deal with um, 7 to 3, 3 mm -hmm. to, seven I, I've to worked seven. in hospitals. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I was doing the, the three 12-hour shifts. Mm. A week, and I mean, I I really appreciated that schedule. My family did not, and so it was really <laughs> trying on them and trying to find a balance. There was just it was more than I could ask. But um, coming to uh, Green Mountain Sports Services has just been one better schedule. <laughs> they're, they're so accommodating. They are, and I consider them my family. And I've been working with yeah, them like, for what, about eight months. Yeah. Now. On that note, yeah. we're like a big wanna, family. <laughs> yeah. Yes. On that note, we'd like to thank you for joining me on thank this edition you so of much. Ableton Thanks on for Air. Having us. Um, for more information on Green Mountain Support Services, where can they go? Uh, they can go to gmssi.org. And you can. Uh, Is there a phone number? Yes. Yes. 802-888-7602. Repeat that one more time, please. That's 802-888-7602. This program is sponsored majority in part by Green Mountain Support Services and Washington County Mental Health. Ableton On Air is generously supported by Green Mountain Support Services to empower neighbors with disabilities to be home in the community. Other sponsorship include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together.